I encourage everyone to go ahead and open up a Bible to Mark chapter 5. Uh, there are paper Bibles in the chair kind of in front of you. Um, we're going to be covering a decent amount of scripture, and so if you're looking at something that's not on the screen, it might be nice to have it. Um, I know some people like to, I, I rarely say this, I'm not judging. It, some people like to use their phone, but that's always distracting. So if you want to have a Bible open, I always encourage it to be a paper one. Um, all right, so this week we're going to continue on in, in Mark. And last week, Charlie was here. I had a wonderful time uh, with family, taking a little bit of time off. And Charlie preached on the end of Mark 4 and the beginning of Mark 5. And if you remember, um, it was the story of Jesus calming the sea, calming the storm, and then the healing of the demon-possessed guy. And what's interesting about that is, is you heard from the children. We're, we're going to talk about fear today. But what's interesting about that is both of those instances actually created fear in the people. When the storm rose up, the disciples were afraid. And their response to fear was to blame Jesus. As Charlie said last week, don't you care that we're going to drown? And then Jesus heals the demon-possessed guy and casts out the demons into the pigs and that whole thing. And then the people's response was not to blame Jesus like the disciples, but rather to kick him out. They said, you need to leave. We don't want you here. You're terrifying us. What do we do when we're afraid? I want to look at that psalm again. Robert, would you mind putting up that psalm, the first slide? Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says if you seek his face, your face, Lord, I will seek. When we are afraid, do we seek the Lord? Kind of an underlying question of today. You know, this section in Mark is a wonderful... Uh, Thing that addresses fear, the end of four and then chapter five. It's all about fear. The storm, the demons, and the two stories we're going to read today. And today I want to do something a little differently rather than share kind of my points for the sermon at the end or in the middle. I want to share them with you at the beginning uh, and have them in your mind as we go through them. And they're this. Uh, the first one is this, is that fear leads to doubt and inaction. Or potentially action that may not be from God's will. Meaning that when we're scared, sometimes we seek to control, we seek to go forward. And so we just start doing things that maybe God hasn't called us to do because we're trying to figure it out. Right? Anyone else a, friend, a, a doer? And it's just, you get a scared or maybe I got to find a solution. I got to do something about it. I got to figure it out. Um, so there's a piece of this where we're supposed to sit back and wait on the Lord, like the psalm says. But when we have strong faith, it leads us to hope and what I would actually call action within God's will. So when we have a strong faith that Christ calls us to as his disciples, my, our hope, like the psalmist also, would be that our fear leads us to action and hope and trust in what God has for us, and then our actions, the things we do, actually are within the will of God. So we see here the first half of what Charlie preached on last week, Mark 4 and 5, is people living in fear, and today we're actually going to see two responses with pretty amazing faith. Um, and that's the story we're going to read. And so we'll talk about this and uh, how we can interpret these passages. So we're in Mark chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 21 and following. It's a longer passage, so bear with me. And again, it'd be nice to maybe have it open if you want to revisit anything. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. One of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors, had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. And at once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some of the people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? 
Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. And he went into them and said, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and he went in to where the child was. He took her by the hand, and he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk. She was 12 years old. And at this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. So I titled this sermon, Do Not Be Afraid, Just Believe, and I wanted to read the scriptures to show you those are actually the words of Jesus. I'm not being harsh. Because uh, it, if you were afraid and someone came to you and said, oh, don't be afraid, just believe in God, you'd roll your eyes and sort of say, easier said than done, I'm scared. I just got this diagnosis. My parents just had this. I just had this. Whatever it might be, fear is real. And in those moments, it's sort of tough to know. What do we do? Do we wait on the Lord or do we act? Do we sit back and pray and, and, and hope for a miracle, or do we go forward and act? And how do we balance these things? You know, you ever met someone who seems really lazy and they're using the wait is the Lord as an excuse? You know, what, what are you going to do about this? Ah, I'm just going to wait on the Lord. You sort of think, yeah, but you could get up and do something. Or vice versa, the person who doesn't seem to ever pray and wait and just goes, 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 and you say, well, just slow down. Have you, have you prayed about it? Have you thought? Have you talked to them? No, 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 I'm just going to take care of it. See, a lot of times in the Christian life, like, like most things, there's a tension here. How do we wait on the Lord but also act with wisdom? I think that's what we're all looking for in life. How can we be faithful disciples, as we're talking about in this whole series on Mark, how do we be a disciple of Jesus Christ, wait on the Lord like the psalmist talks about, but then still reach out to the Lord? How do we wait prayerfully and with faith while also acting in, in, within God's will? And it's a tough balance, and that's what we're going to talk about. How do we wait on the Lord and act with wisdom? Well, first we're going to look at the bleeding woman. The bleeding woman in our story um, comes up to Jesus and it tells us that she's been suffering of some sort of ailment for, for many years. And, and in our world today, we read a medical issue and we think, oh, she had some sort of like personal medical issue that she was wrestling with and had been going on and it was really, really tough. But it was far from just a personal issue. Let me remind you of some of the, the laws of the day that if someone was bleeding, someone had an open wound of any kind, that they were ceremonially unclean. All right, so what would that mean? That means they have limited social interaction. I mean, they can't go into the synagogues and worship. They can't go and see the rabbi. They can't go into... Imagine that. This person was not just suffering physically, but was also a social and religious outcast for how many years? Say 12 years. This is a lot more than just a physical ailment. This was a person who everyone would have looked at as dirty, as unclean. I can't be around you. You're an outsider. You live outside the town, outside the city walls. And this was not a well-thought-of person. This was someone who was suffering, not just physically, but suffering socially, who everyone looked at as someone who needs to stay away. I mean, really, think about that. This ailment made her an outcast from her community. And so Jesus comes to town. And she's clearly heard of Jesus because Jesus has been doing all these miracles. We've been reading about in the first couple chapters of Mark. And look what she says in verse 28. She says, I just need to touch this guy. I just need to get close to this guy. I just need to reach out and touch him. Because if I touch his clothes, I might be healed. No, I will be healed. We see great faith. We see the faith of someone who says, listen, I, this is going to happen. What does her faith lead her to? Hope and action. Her faith in this Jesus said, this person will heal me, and, and, and then action that was so special. And I've spoken about this before, and I've, I've, I've preached on this passage before. It's one of my favorite things. It's actually the first sermon I ever preached was on Mark 4 and 5 years ago to, you know, in big church uh, when I was 22 or 23 years old. But the difference between the crowds and this woman. Look at the next slide. She reaches out and touches him. Jesus re recognizes and says, who touched me? And then his disciples, not always the best. I mean, he picked them, but they, they weren't always the best. Jesus, all these people are around you. What do you mean who touched you? It's a crazy thing to say. And what I always say about this passage that is so helpful for me 
and it's helpful for our world today, is are you going through the motions and bumping into Jesus, or are you reaching out and touching Jesus? Uh, are you reaching out and touching Jesus, or are you going through the motions and bumping into him? Are you going to church? Are you going to Bible study? Are you doing all the right stuff and just sort of walking alongside, bumping into Jesus in the crowd? Or are you, from your, deep down in your heart, like the psalmist says, crying out to Jesus and reaching out and touching him because you need help? She reaches out and touches him. Her faith, deep down inside, knowing that Jesus is the one who can heal me, leads to hope in her soul and action within the will of God. Second example, the synagogue leader, Jairus and his daughter. Jesus comes to town, and, and go back to the, we go back to the first slide? Yeah, thanks, Robert. Look at the posture of this guy. He's a teacher of the law. We have just come out of a section in Mark where the teachers of the law are planning to kill Jesus and are mad at him. This teacher of the law comes to him and says, I need help, falls at his feet and says, please help. He comes to Jesus with a posture of humility rather than competition or pride like the other teachers of the law. Comes to Jesus with a posture of humility, lays at his feet and says, please help me. And as they're walking, this thing with the woman happens and all these crowds are around. And then the scriptures tell us that people come from his house and say to him the thing that he never wanted to hear. It's too late. She's gone. Now, in this moment, we can't know exactly how he feels, but we know it probably was a crisis, uncertainty, fear. Let's just call it what it is. He was terrified. What do I do now? My daughter has died. I've, I've bothered the teacher. I'm in, like, what in the world do we do? And Jesus sees it, and he feels it, and he knows it. And so Jesus looks at him and says this thing that to us sometimes seems ridiculous and says, hey, don't be afraid. Believe. Now, we know how hard this is, right? You ever been worrying and someone says, oh, don't worry. Thanks. Right? <laughs> oh, I'm scared this might happen. Oh, don't be afraid. I'm sure it'll all work out. Awesome. Thanks for that. Doesn't help. So what is Jesus getting at here? Why does he say this thing that to us seems like an empty platitude? Well, on the one hand, I think it's true. I really do. But I think Jesus is getting them and trying to get them to focus on what started the process, which was belief. What started the process? This guy believed Jesus could do it. Something happened along the way that wasn't expected. How many of you, don't raise your hand, it's all of us, had something happened in life that was unexpected? <laughs> in your walk, in your life with Jesus, maybe with your family, maybe with your job situation, maybe with your own health, I don't know, but maybe you had something happen that was not expected, and along the way you were forced with a crisis, and Jesus looks at us and then says to us a similar thing. Don't be afraid to believe. You started believing. You started following me. Keep going. But, 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 no, 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 keep going. See, friends, when fear comes, what Jesus wants us to do is continue on the path we've already started. What happens when we get scared is what? Human nature kicks in. We pull away from our Christian community. Well, I don't want to bother them. They don't want to hear about it. When, when we get scared, we begin to doubt in God, like the disciples with the storm. We say, don't you care, Jesus, that this is happening to me? Friends, Jesus knows. So Jesus goes, tells them not to be afraid. And what's interesting is then he only takes the faithful. He takes the three, Peter, James, and John, and then the, the father and mother. Everyone else he kicks out. Everyone else he kicks out, and they're wailing and crying. And, and, and Jesus basically says to them, hey, don't worry about it. She's just sleeping. And they all laugh and mock, and they don't have the same faith. And so Jesus says, you guys don't get to see this. You don't get to see this because you do not have this level of faith. And, and, and I don't know what your life experience is like. This is true for me. When I have the greatest, sometimes craziest faith is when I actually see the miracles that mean the most to me. And so in this instance, really, I think sometimes the simplest answer makes the most sense is he brought in these three disciples who he was closest with and who showed more faith than the others and these parents, and he showed them and did this wonderful miracle just in front of the five of them and then says, hey, don't, don't make this a big deal. This was a gift for you as a response to your faith. What a gift. See, friends, faith and hope leads us to acting within God's will, and then we see more of the greatness of God. But when we doubt and when we fear and we run away and we isolate from God, we begin to miss these things because we're not looking for them. And what Jesus is commanding and showing his disciples is that the continuation of the last couple of weeks is that he is in control. We have nothing to fear. Go through the order of the two stories from last week and then this week. 
It's the storm. Are you afraid of the outside world crushing you and hurting you? Jesus says, I'm in control of that. Demons and evil. Are you afraid of evil and demons and all these other things in your life? And Jesus says, no, no, no. Lord over those two. Health. Are you afraid of health ailments and all of these other things? Jesus says, no, no, I can heal those things too. And are you afraid of death, the very thought of death? Are you terrified of what that might look like? Jesus says here and then again with his life, death, and crucifixion and resurrection to say, no, no, I'm Lord over that too. What are you afraid of? We'll have fear. Stuff happens in life where fear is the response. I mean, even Jesus got scared the night before the crucifixion, right? He prayed, Lord, take this cup from me. But then he got up and kept going. We'll have fear. These things happen. But if we're not practicing belief and faith, whether it be through prayer, Christian community, reading the scriptures, whatever it is, if we're not practicing faith and living out our faith in every single day, when fear comes, it will paralyze us. And we will give in to the things that draw us away from God and that inaction or action outside of the will of God like I talked about. And I want to complain here for a little bit because this is one of the things that drives me absolutely bonkers in the world today is how fear is driving everything. Right? Before we, I, I'll be self-critical first of the church. Have you ever heard Christians say something like this? And if you've ever said it before, it's okay. It's natural human language. But I want to just point something out here for a second. I hear people say this all the time for trying to get headlines or clicks or whatever, you know. The biggest threat to Christianity is blank. And my first response is, really? Christ's church is threatened? I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know God didn't win. I didn't know God was threatened by human beings. Remember the story of the Tower of Babel when the human beings build the tower? The, the book of Genesis has great play on words in Hebrew where it says that these people built this tower to be like God and to, to be up in the heavens. And then the scriptures say that God had to come down to see what they were doing. He was so big and mighty. Mocking the actions of a human being. See, people say these fear things to try to get us on board. And in reality, when people say the biggest threat is this, no, 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 Christ is not threatened. You are threatened. Christ's church is never going to die. It hasn't died and it won't die. When we say, when something says the biggest threat to Christianity, what you're saying is, no, 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 I'm threatened by this, and I'm worried about this. And that's okay. It happens. But friends, realize there is no threat to Christianity. There is nothing to be afraid of. Romans chapter 8, like I shared with the kids, there is nothing that can separate us from God's love. Nothing. What are we afraid of? And, and, and fear is driving everything in the world. Look at the news. Look at politics. Look at all of these things. What's the whole thing? Oh, let's be terrified of this. And oh, here's our solution. Oh, here's the problem. Let's all be terrified of this. And oh, vote for this person. Believe this thing. Do this way. Live in this way and we'll solve the problem. Here's the antidote to the problem. Friends, the Bible is very, very clear. What is the antidote to the problem? Jesus. <laughs> That's it. We joke all the time, the Sunday school answer, but Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is freedom. Jesus is healing. I mean, look at the stories we just read. He is the solution to all of our problems and fears. And when he says, don't be afraid, just believe, he means it. But he doesn't mean it in an empty way. He means it in a way to say, look at what I've done. Look at what I've already shown you. Look at what I've already revealed to you. Why do you keep doing this? Friends, there are no threats to Jesus. <laughs> He has already conquered death and won. We pray, we believe, we know there's going to be challenges, we know there's hardship in the world, but God's perfect will will be done. Galatians says, Paul says it's very clear to the Galatian church that God will not be mocked. God has already said that he wins. Christ conquered death. What more could we possibly be afraid of? And to be a disciple of Jesus Christ is to believe that is to believe that we are not approaching this life with fear or a desire to control or an agenda, but simply to follow Jesus and believe. So if Jesus says, hey, this child is not asleep or not dead, she's asleep, we say, okay, let's go. The bleeding woman, if you feel like there is something in your life that cannot be healed, are you reaching out and touching Jesus? The synagogue leader, if you feel like there is a family member, if there is something in your life, if there is a broken relationship, if there is a fear you have that you feel like cannot be, or it's done, or it's completed, or it's already dead, do you honestly think that Jesus cannot raise that from the dead and restore and redeem it? 
Because Jesus told his disciples, hey, believe I can do this and follow me. What is Jesus asking of his disciples in this passage and what is he asking of us? That we are called to believe, and this is the hardest part, we are called to believe even if it doesn't happen. Because the first criticism of this is say, yeah, pastor, but you know what? I've prayed for this every single day for 40 years and it hasn't happened. So? There's a couple of passages in scripture I really don't like. James chapter 3, verse 1. Not all of you should be teachers because those who teach will be judged more strictly. It's my issue. But the, another one that my wife and I, Jenna and I, always talk about that we really don't like, but it's very, very convicting is from Daniel chapter 3. It's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they won't bow down to the idol, and they're going to get thrown in the fire. And if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Remember, Daniel 3.18, whenever you're struggling. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty. We will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. This passage is brutal, but it's so good. Because even if God doesn't, and even if there's suffering, and even if you're scared, and that answer to prayer never, ever comes, Christ has promised us through his life, death, resurrection, and ascension that we will be with him forever. And so even as, as um, it's going to get an emotional response, even as Jim is talking about this issue in the Congo and things happening around the world and people are dying today and suffering, and you say, well, wait a minute, we prayed for them. Why are they not delivered? Why are they refugees now? Why have they lost everything? Christ has promised them that he will be with them. And so, let me ask you again, what is our response to fear? Because if we're fearful, the things I brought up first, if we're fearful, and if we doubt, it leads to either inaction or action away from the will of God. And I don't think that's what God has for us as disciples. I think God has called us to faith that leads to hope, and it leads to action within God's will. When we believe that God is big enough and God can, and we continually pray and we continually hope and we continually believe as the disciples were called to do, acting within God's will is much easier. It's not easy, but it's easier. And these ideas intersect with so many areas of life. It can be really difficult. But brothers and sisters, just hear me now. What Jesus is calling his disciples to do at this point in the journey, in Mark chapter 5, is simply this. When things happen that don't seem logical, when things happen outside of God's will, when things happen that you never planned, will you continue to believe? Or will you give up on it? Will you reach out to Jesus daily? Will you have the posture of Jairus, the synagogue's leader, daughter, leaders, uh, the synagogue leader, Will you have his posture of humility to fall at Jesus' feet and reach out to him and just every single day, sometimes twice a day, maybe you're a three times a day person, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and call out to Jesus for help? Because I truly believe that's where this peace and this hope was going to come from in our lives. And, and if anyone in this room says, you know, pastor, I, I think I'm good on peace and hope. I think I have enough hope and peace in my life, then you don't need to do this. But for the rest of us who need more peace and more hope and more faith in this life, I look at this story and I am so encouraged because I see it and I think this is what I need more of. This is what we need more of. This is the antidote to the fear of this world as people who look to Jesus with faith in their heart and say it's not about the result, it's about the belief that what Christ did on the cross, which we're going to celebrate here in a minute with communion, is enough. And there is no fear then let us follow Jesus. And for those who claim to be a disciple of Jesus, let us continue down this road together. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you. God, you are good. Even though our lives don't always reflect it, even though we have questions, even though we fear. Lord, you are good. Your mercy endures forever, and we thank you for that. Father, I thank you for the foundation of Jesus Christ that we have. Lord, how firm and strong that foundation is. And as we sing this song, Lord, how firm a foundation, let us remember your promises, the hope we have in you and you alone. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.